Hi everyone, um, I would like to ask you today to uh, join me to explore the economic forces behind the Manila Galleon. The Manila Galleon was this uh, very interesting uh, trade episode uh, in pre-modern history. It was a trade route that um, existed between Acapulco in what today is Mexico and Manila in the Philippines. It was very interesting for at least two reasons. The first one is that uh, it was a global activity. It was deeply connected with something called Carrera Indias, which was the trade route between uh, the Americas, the, 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 the European colonies in, in America and Europe, in particular, in particular uh, talking about the Spanish Empire. So it was probably the first time where you had connected um, through trade Asia, America, and Europe. The second uh, aspect, aspect that makes the Manila Galleon extremely interesting is that it was a really complex activity at different levels and we're going to, to explore that. So let me start by um, Describing a bit the type of trade that was related to this. This was a highly specialized uh, intersectoral trade. Every region was producing uh, their specialties and were exchanged uh, to each other. So the ships from Acapulco departed with things that came from several regions of America. Silver that came not only from Mexico, but also from Peru. But you had also things like cochineal, seeds, sweet potatoes, tobacco many, many different types of goods that came once again from different parts of America. But you had also goods that came from Europe. Usually they arrived to Veracruz through this Carrera Indias uh, route and uh, they were transported uh, by land uh, to Acapulco and shipped there. And you had, uh, in this case, things like wine, olive oil, etc. But you also had on the other side of the ocean uh, an agglomeration of products that came from all over Asia that were exported to America and eventually some of that will be re-exported to, to Europe from China. There were things like cloth and silk products, but also from the Middle East and India, right? Things like rocks, uh, camel hairs, etc. Now, I described it to you that it was a highly complex activity in many different uh, levels, but just imagine that the Pacific Ocean was this new space uh, for Europeans recently discovered, and it implied like many different kinds of, of risks. So uh, the operations were highly regulated and they consisted in at least four ships sailing together uh, at certain uh, seasons of the year, uh, both from Manila and, and Acapulco, and they had to face this fourth month's uh, journey and they had to be escorted by uh, an armed uh, set of ships in order to protect them from uh, pirates but also from other global powers that were um, in, in war in, in different periods of time with the Spanish Empire. But um, probably the best way to think and, and, and to grab some idea of how complex this was is to think about the ships that were involved in this. These were the largest ships uh, ever made on, uh, 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 until then. And to give you an idea, you can compare them with La Santa Maria, which was the largest uh, ship uh, in the first um, voyage of, Colum of Columbus to, to America. And, and you can tell how this... Uh, ships in the, of the Manila Galleon were several times larger than La Santa Maria. So, for instance, you had uh, a, a capacity of something like 2,000 uh, tons, while La Santa Maria had uh, uh, not more than uh, uh, 150. Obviously, they could uh, carry a much larger set of passengers, something like 500, while La Santa Maria had a crew of 39 and of course they were much much um, larger but how is uh, possible that such a complex activity was uh, developed in this um, uh, period of, of time well the thing is that it was a really profitable activity 
Uh, and it was preferable because it implied uh, the connection of the two most important uh, markets of the moment, Western Europe and China. And um, it was profitable, but it was profitable because um, the conjuncture uh, of the moment, which was really particular. So on the one hand, this was this market appetite on both uh, of these markets for goods produced on, on, on the other side. So in Europe, there, there was this increasing interest in, in the exotic goods from Asia, like spices and stuff. In Asia, there was, uh, in particular in China, I'm going to talk about more in a bit, a huge demand for silver that was mostly produced in, in America. Um, but it was not just a, a matter of this, it was also a, a matter of the institutional environment of the moment. So uh, we were facing a very concrete geopolitical context in which Spain was expanding over the, the world. They had already conquered the most uh, strategical uh, locations of uh, America. They had arrived also and controlled the Philippines. And the Ottoman Empire was in, uh, located in, in, in Asia, uh, in the Middle East in particular. And that was a, a constraint for, for the trade routes that crossed uh, the Levant and, and eventually reached um, Asia. But this was all possible just because also sort of coincidentally, um, the technological conditions were ideal for this. So back then the, the humanity was leaving this um, expansion um, across the, the oceans and we had a much better knowledge uh, of them. So to give you an idea of this, uh, this is the first map that included America uh, on it. This is the, the map of Juan de la Cosa. And some, you can tell how it is a fairly rough and, and, and sort of wacky kind of, of map. But some decades later, uh, we had already the Mercator War map that probably it's really inaccurate for current standards, but you could you, you can tell that it is a, a fairly uh, good map and, and, and did a pretty like, broad description uh, of the world that uh, it's clearly a, a huge improvement in, in terms of, of, of location and navigation. And there were several other uh, innovations during this period related to uh, techniques of, of navigation, but also about the ship's use. And I already described it to you, but the ships uh, became much larger and capable during this, this period. So everything was ideal for the development of the Manila Galleon. But Probably the most important reason behind it was the, the demand, the high demand for silver in China. And the story behind this is, is the following. Um, China for several centuries used a monetary system based on paper money. However, during the last part of the Ming Dynasty, uh, things started to go wrong and there was this huge hyperinflation and um, they decided, uh, the government decided to change, the, to switch to a different monetary system. And this was a transition that <clears throat> was only made completely uh, by the Qing dynasty. But to make the story short, they adopted silver as the, uh, the, as the main currency. And the thing is that China was already then this huge economy. It was something like a fourth of the world population. So the fact that they all moved to silver implied a huge increase in the demand for silver. And that led to a uh, process that rocketed the prices of, of silver. You can tell here uh, the, 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 the prices of silver in Jingnan. Uh, and you can tell how they uh, increased during a bomb and eventually they uh, reduced, however, they were still pretty high uh, while the costs of production were uh, reducing uh, during this period. So eventually by the late uh, 18th century, you will see uh, an equalization of the, of the price of, of silver uh, in Europe and in China. But it was a, a profitable business for quite a while. So eventually the silver from all over the world was, was eventually uh, moving uh, towards uh, China. So this is a map that illustrates this. It is in <coughs> metric uh, 
uh, tons and yearly average of production. So in America, most of the silver produced during this, this period was produced in America. Some of that flew through the Manila Galleon precisely um, and the Pacific to Asia. And the large majority of it uh, flew to, to Europe. Uh, the thing is that most of that uh, silver eventually arrived to China as well uh, through other routes, right? The Levant or the Cabo or the Baltic, uh, the Baltic Sea uh, route. And that was the, the, the big force behind uh, the, the existence of the Manila Galleon. So um, I would like to end up uh, exploring a particular case that shed uh, some light on, on the uneven uh, like roles of different regions in, in the Manila Galleon. And, and that's why I would like to tell you about uh, the New Granada, which was this jurisdiction that corresponds to what today is Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and, and Venezuela. But you can imagine that it's basically Colombia and because the, the, the particular frontier, the particular frontiers of, of, of this jurisdiction change um, over time. And the fact that the issue here is that the role of the Manila Galleon was quite modest. Um, in um, in the New Granada, so uh, they were pretty much uh, not involved in the Pacific part of trade, and it was probably limited uh, to the import of uh, silk uh, goods that arrive actually not directly from Veracruz but from Caracas. And the reason why the role of the New Granada was so modest uh, is related to several uh, reasons. So one of them is that. Uh, the New Granada was basically a uh, population constructed over the mountains. These are Los Andes, and you can see how it uh, divides when uh, when they get when when the mountains get to Colombia, and you see how the cities um, and the, the settlements uh, uh, created during the the colonial period, the early colonial period were limited pretty much to the, the mountainous regions. And the ones that were created in the coast were basically in the Atlantic coast. Notice that there are none of them in the Pacific. And one of the reasons for this are the geological and, and the geographical uh, conditions of the Pacific in Colombia, which, is, which are quite different from the ones, let's say, in Peru and Chile. If you think about them, like this sort of desertic kind of area as well. This is pretty much a, a, a huge forest that it's quite difficult to penetrate. And the, the, the cost, the transport costs subsisted for quite a long time. They didn't limit it to the interaction with the Pacific, but also with the uh, Atlantic. And you can tell now how by the end of the independence, uh, the end of the colonial period, the, inter the transport costs in, in Colombia, where the New Granada then were, were much higher than uh, from any other uh, place in, in Latin America. And it was then not just expensive to import and export goods uh, from the New Granada, but the thing is that the New Granada was also a fairly poor region uh, during this whole period. So they didn't have the, the capacity to be like a huge market that received uh, goods from the from from the outside world and finally they were not um in an economy based on silver they were not large sil silver producers they were a uh, great gold producer eventually they would become the largest uh, producers of of gold uh by the uh, early uh, 19th century but they didn't produce much silver if you compare it with what peru or mexico did and that's part of why it was isolated from the um, from the Manila Galleon parcel. The takeaway from uh, this uh, from this presentation would be that the Manila Galleon was this probably first experience of global trade, but it wasn't an even process. It was not uh, a homogeneous thing where the whole world was connected. There were some central actors that. Uh, guided the, the evolution of, of the trade patterns, which were basically China and Western Europe. There were some intermediaries like Mexico and the Philippines, and there were some regions that had a, a pretty weak um, role part of the periphery. It would be great to have more studies on these issues, a really exciting topic. 
and in particular, I think, and, and, and I will ask you to uh, get involved in long-term consequences of this trade. This is a really exciting uh, um, topic. And please, that's pretty much it. Write me.